Hi, everyone. This is Angela Cialana, one of the hosts of Journeys of Hope. Thanks so much for downloading this Pilgrim Center of Hope podcast. And we are so grateful to our sponsor who made this podcast possible in honor of Valentin, Nicholas, and Francisco Campos. If you also would like to join us as a missionary of hope in this mission, please visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Now, here is your journey of hope. Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the universal church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope, your passport to sacred destinations around the world. This new program produced by Pilgrim Center of Hope provides you with a virtual pilgrimage to all the places associated with the history of our church and written about in scripture. For the last 26 years, Pilgrim Center of Hope has led over 70 authentic spiritual pilgrimages to the Holy Land, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Marian apparition sites, and beyond. As a result, Journeys of Hope is able to take you to these holy sites so that you can experience what it is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, the Virgin Mary, the Apostles, and the Saints. Aside from transporting you to all these distant holy sites, we also like to take you on local pilgrimages to sacred destinations that played a major role in the establishment of the Catholic Church in the San Antonio area. Hello again, and my name is Angela Cialana. I'm the coordinator, a media coordinator for Pilgrim Center of Hope. And thanks for being with us on this journey. Pilgrim Center of Hope is the co-producer of Journeys of Hope alongside Guadalupe Radio Network. Our programs are available on podcast and also on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. If you're new to the program, I encourage you to take a look at our Journeys of Hope archive, which contains all the previous episodes of the show. This week, we're continuing a unique mini-series inspired by the words of St. Peter's first letter in the New Testament. Come to him, a living stone rejected by human beings, but chosen and precious in the sight of God. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house. And that is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5, 4 through 5. That term, living stones, is one that we often use on pilgrimage. When pilgrims visit the holy sites, they see structures made of stone, but it is also essential to visit the living stones, those whose ancestors passed on the faith to them, and those who are living witnesses to Jesus Christ. So, we begin a journey with the living stones, wherein we will accompany pilgrims as they take us back to their pilgrimage journey and unpack some of the things that they learned and were transformed by. So this week, we want to a journey to Mount Carmel in the Holy Land alongside our living stone, Marjorie McClellan. Welcome, Marjorie. Thank you, Angela. I'm so happy to be with you today. Before we embark on our pilgrimage to Mount Carmel, I would like to explain that I am a secular Discalc Carmelite layperson who belongs to the Discalc Carmelite order here in San Antonio. As secular laymen or women, we live in the world, but we take formal vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience in accordance with our state in life. Whereas discounts means shoeless or reform to its original stricter rules by St. Teresa of Avila, a Spanish nun and doctor of the church who lived from 1515 to 1582. This is why my husband and I were so interested in participating in this Holy Land pilgrimage and going to Mount Carmel. We had already been on pilgrimages to the Holy Land in the past, to Italy, believe it or not, France as well. Uh, we had been to Spain, Greece, Turkey, many of the other Marian sites. So uh, this trip to Haifa, to go to Mount Carmel was very important to me after I became a Carmelite secular. Beautiful. 
Well, uh, as we uh, get into the uh, program, I know that you have uh, that connection to um, to the local uh, Carmelites, and we're going to be talking about uh, Mount Carmel. Uh, but uh, thank you for giving us that that background and that local connection. May I put in a little plug for please, the friars? Please do. Okay, the Carmelite friars uh, at uh, San Antonio's. Uh, site uh, for Mount Carmel, which is uh, the Carmelite friars are embarking on a restoration project for the basilica, and that basilica is located at 1715 North Zarzamora Street off of Calabra Road here in San Antonio. They need to restore the building as well as establish the basilica as a center for Carmelite spirituality. Our local community has taken on, as an apostolate, this latter goal to share Carmelite spirituality, and part of that is helping people learn about this beautiful and very special place of prayer. Basilica originally meant royal house, and our basilica is one of four minor basilicas in Texas that include San Juan de Valle, the Cathedral in Galveston, and the Basilica of St. Anthony in Beaumont. All of the major basilicas, however, are in Rome, but all basilicas carry special responsibilities and uh, privileges. If you don't mind, I'll add just a little bit more about Mm -hmm. that basilica. It all started in 1923 when the bishop invited Carmelites to establish a parish here. So in 1926, Discounts Carmelites established this San Antonio Parish. Shortly after that, in 1927, the bishop gave permission to build a shrine in honor of the newly canonized St. Therese of Lisieux, also called the Little Flower. Right. And in 1998, it was elevated to the status of a minor basilica. So that, uh, that is definitely the local connection, and thank you for giving us that. Um, and uh, the Carmelites themselves go uh, very, very far back in history, don't they? Oh, we do. The origins of the order began with the Crusaders. Returning from fighting in the Holy Land, they desired to stay together, to form a community, to live as hermits on Mount Carmel and St. Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, as a model of prayer and zeal for the church. In the 1200s, Bishop Albert of Jerusalem gave them a rule of life and called them brothers of the Most Holy Virgin Mary. They built a chapel in the center with cells surrounding it. Their charism was prayer, silence, solitude, and zeal for the church. They quickly spread throughout Europe. By the 1500s, though, they had been around long enough for some things to become very lax, so that St. Teresa of Jesus, a Spanish Carmelite nun, was inspired to make changes in her convents. With the help of St. John of the Cross, she reformed the order and founded the Discalced, and Discalced means barefoot or no shoes, Mm -hmm. Carmelite order. She began or became the first female doctor of the church. Shortly before the end of the Great Depression in 1929, three Carmelite priests, Friars, who originally were from Spain, were invited by Bishop Drosarts of San Antonio to come and form the community here, and they were assigned and arrived in 1926. So when my husband and I saw this pilgrimage Mm -hmm. opportunity come up, we quickly grabbed at it Mm -hmm. uh, to begin our third pilgrimage to the Holy Land, flying into Tel Aviv Airport and the bus trip to Haifa on Mount Carmel. Beautiful. And that was in 2014, That was. And, uh, well, uh, that gives us a good uh, launching point. Uh, So thank you for for all of that 
uh, those uh, background details so that we can have a, a picture in our minds of how Mount Carmel really fits into our faith, as well as our faith community here in San Antonio. Um, so, and as well, if you all who are listening are interested um, in learning more about the Basilica, we do definitely recommend that you go down to um, the Little Flower Basilica here in San Antonio. And we also uh, have a Journeys of Hope program about the Little Flower Basilica as well. So feel free to go into our Journeys of Hope archives and check that out as well. Well, we'll have some time to dive in a bit deeper uh, into some of the saints that you mentioned, Marjorie, um, uh, related to Mount Carmel, the Carmelites as well. But let's set off on our journey to Mount Carmel in Haifa in the Holy Land. So Mount Carmel is uh, really lovely to visit while you're on pilgrimage in the Holy Land. It is located at the present day city of, of Haifa in Israel. And it's actually a mountain range against which the city is situated. So from Mount Carmel, you can see a beautiful view of the rich blue Mediterranean Sea. And I remember standing on the edge of the mountain and looking out onto that beautiful site. And I, you know, even though I wasn't there for very long, I was only there for maybe a few hours because my pilgrimage, we arrived uh, to Mount Carmel at night. So it wasn't until the morning when I was able to really drink in that beautiful uh, blue Mediterranean Sea. So uh, you mentioned, Marjorie, that Elijah is important to the Carmelites. And uh, as we visit Mount Carmel, we will see reminders of his presence everywhere. Um, and we read about his activities in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament in the first book of Kings. So a long line of kings was committing evil against God and the people, promoting a cult of false gods known as Baals. And Elijah's prophetic work was to challenge that evil. And of course, the work of a prophet, any prophet, is to act as the voice of God and to convey the message of God's word and to turn the people towards God. So uh, there are two very famous stories about Elijah, and this will give us uh, some understanding, some appreciation for Mount Carmel. So first we hear about Elijah challenging the Baal prophets in 1 Kings chapter 18. And he called all the people to himself at Mount Carmel to demonstrate the power of the Almighty One God versus the false gods or Baals that were being worshipped. So he challenged the 450 Baal prophets to call down fire from heaven to consume a sacrifice on the altar. Imagine how chaotic and just, wow, what that would have been like. Of course, they failed. They failed to have their, their Baal call down fire from heaven. And even after cutting themselves with swords and spears, it was a really a bloody mess. Whereas Elijah's prayer to the one true God was heard and the sacrifice on the altar was consumed by fire from heaven. So this is the famous um, uh, biblical account of Elijah's activities on Mount Carmel. And after this happened, Elijah fled for his life and he arrived at a cave on the mountain of God Horeb which is what we read in scripture. And that description is actually quite vague. Uh, scripture scholars are not exactly sure which mountain that would have been. However, on Mount Carmel, there is a cave where we know that Elijah stayed when he was on Mount Carmel. And I visited, and uh, as well you did, uh, Marjorie, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I remembered the scripture story about Elijah listening for the voice of God, the voice of the Lord, which he found not in the violent winds or in the earthquake or the fire that passed while he waited, but in a still small voice, right? That's where he found the voice of God. So I'd like for us to take our listeners now around the entire pilgrim complex on Mount Carmel. And we'll talk about that cave uh, in addition to the other things. So let's put ourselves in uh, the mindset of arriving in Mount Carmel. So as we arrive, you drive up to this white stone building that has a fairly simple facade. Um, this is the guest house 
where pilgrims can reserve rooms and stay the night, uh, just like a hotel, and it is run by the Carmelites, and I still remember being greeted by the sisters in their habits behind the front desk. So, uh, Marjorie, what was it like for you to stay at the guest house there on Mount Carmel? Our first night in the Holy Land was at that Carmelite pilgrimage hotel next to the Carmelite monastery after Mass in the church at Stella Maris. Since our hotel rooms had been converted from the bedrooms of novices and nuns who had lived in Stella Maris, the evening and the night were especially touching for me because during the time I had gone to college at UT when I was a sophomore, I thought I might have a calling uh, to mm. be a nun. Mm. And so I had gone on retreat in Castorville to see if I had a vocation. We stayed in some of the novices' rooms there and spent a great deal of time at the beautiful church there. And so to be able to stay in a nun's room <laughs> where she had lived was very important to mm. me. And it seemed like God was speaking to me and continuing my story as mm. well. How beautiful. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the church. So, yes, besides the guest house, there is also a monastery and a beautiful church and a lighthouse as well, because you're right there on the edge of the of the mountain, right over the sea. It is beautiful. Uh, the Carmelites founded a small monastery in the 17th century near the modern lighthouse and then moved to the current location in the 18th century. And after it was destroyed in 1821, the current monastery was rebuilt in 1836. So the entire complex is called Stella Maris. Marjorie, uh, I know this is important to the Carmelites, so could you give us some background on the name Stella Maris, as well as Carmel, and how this complex on Mount Carmel relates to the context of your Carmelite order? I'd be glad to. Great. The Carmelite order was founded in the prophetic spirit of Elijah by a group of crusaders, as we've already mentioned, who began to live and form a religious community life gathering around the chapel of Our Lady here on Mount Carmel. When the Crusader stronghold at Akko fell to the Muslims in 1291, the order migrated to Europe. It is not known that Our Lord visited Mount Carmel. However, it was a good beginning for our pilgrimage. Carm, meaning vineyard, and El, meaning God. Mm. Carmel means vineyard of God. The Church of Stella Maris, Star of the Sea, a title given to Our Lady, is built over a cave which came to be known as Elijah's Cave, where he heard the still, small voice of God, mm -hmm. as is read in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 14. Sacred art refers to the Old Testament scriptures pertaining to the life of Elijah. On parts of the walls in the church, simple art in beige and brown colors testify to five different major Carmelite saints. St. Therese of Lisieux, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Edith Stein, and Blessed Mary of Jesus uh, Crucified, the first Arab to be elevated to the process of sainthood. Like me, any member of the Carmelite order would yearn to visit this sacred place. Muslims and Jews also visit the church. They both believe in the prophet Elijah. This site is also associated with the brown scapular, the Marian devotion, while the Carmelite orders flourished in Europe throughout the Middle Ages, its founders on Mount Carmel were exiled at the time of the Marmaluke Conquest in 1291. That was for 600 plus years, and they did not return until the 18th century. Construction of the present monastery and basilica was begun in 1836. An earlier monastery complex on this site served as a hospital for Napoleon's French soldiers 
who were slaughtered by the Turks after Napoleon had retreated. There is a monument dedicated to them in front of the church under the Carmelite religious order. Wow, that's a beautiful history. And, uh, you, you know, you really um, uh, enriched our understanding of uh, Mount Carmel, I think, just with those few words that you gave us. So thank you, Marjorie. Um, I'd like to pause just a moment and think back to uh, that meaning of vineyard of God, vineyard of God, Carmel, um, the, the name of Carmel, meaning vineyard of God. Um, so what, is there any in the Carmelite, uh, spirituality, is there any, um, discussion about what the significance is of the, ter- the term vineyard of God, um, perhaps in, uh, that you're familiar with, um, perhaps, uh, you know, and I'm just, I'm struck by that, that, uh, phrase a vineyard of God and, um, you know, when you think of a vineyard, you think of, of course, grapes, right? And, uh, and growing the grapes to produce wine, typically. So uh, for, you know, if, for a Christian to think about a vineyard, um, we hear about the Lord telling us that, uh, that the, we need more laborers in, for the harvest, that uh, we need to ask for laborers to be sent into the vineyard, right? And so many other parables that he gave associated with a vineyard and with agricultural life as well. And uh, so to me, as I hear that, I just think about all of those things coming together around this, this idea of the vineyard of God. And sort of coming together as grapes are crushed, mm-hmm. they sacrificed, and they are used to create literally his blood mm-hmm. on the altar so that uh, we, uh, in our sacrifices, join in that uh, what becomes a beautiful cup mm. of th- that we are so thankful for uh, and that we have in our sacrificial service Mm -hmm. uh, at the altar in the Mass. So uh, it does bring in all the ideas of sacrificing, uh, of uh, being with others in the cup, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, uh, our, our work of a lifetime coming together Mm -hmm. uh, in Christ's body in one way or another. Yes, and that so beautifully um, it goes back to Elijah that we just talked about. Elijah's trying to uh, demonstrate through a sacrifice, right, that God, there is only one true God, right? Yes. And so that idea of sacrifice then carries on into the even modern day Carmelite spirituality. Um, is there anything that you'd like to mention maybe at this point uh, regarding sacrifice? You know, what is sacrifice part of the Carmelite, um, you know, fit, fit formation or in your daily life, maybe as a Carmelite, is that idea of sacrifice something that you think about? Oh, it definitely is. And um, we do come together uh, and offer um, help to each other, help to the community. Just this past weekend, we had a uh, a lovely lesson uh, uh, in the gymnasium there mm. uh, for the community to come. And we had quite a contingent from Del Rio, quite a contingent from several other places and churches who came to share the word uh, about Teresa of Avila and some of the other saints. Mm. But uh, it's beautiful uh, the way that people are offering up their lives, their time, mm-hmm. their talents. And so that was a big part of our sharing as our community came together Saturday morning, this past Saturday. Yeah. Well, certainly the the Carmelite saints that we've heard about a little bit so far, um, we'll talk about more uh, in the next uh, segment. But, uh, you know, to kind of wrap up this uh, conversation about um, leading up into the, the present day church, because I know friends that are listening, you're you're just itching to get into the church. And we, we will certainly get into that in the in the second segment. But to, uh, you know, really uh, drive home this idea of 
the vineyard of God, um, you know, uh, the saints, the Carmelite saints had so much sacrifice in their life as well. When you think about, uh, you know, first of all, Little Flower Basilica is uh, named after the little flower, Therese of Lisieux, and she really had a lot of sacrifice in her life, didn't she? Oh, she definitely did. Uh, as a child, uh, she had a lot to offer. Uh, and losing her father at a young age. And uh, it, her family went through a great deal of trial, but most of all, losing her mother at a very young age. Uh, and so that affected the, the family. The older sisters did try to step in. Several of them did go on to the convent. Um, and so Therese, um, I think, clung to family, and especially mm-hmm. her father, mm-hmm. uh, and learned so much from him. I think of in the beautiful tomb area in the basilica, uh, you can see the stained glass around it. And as I take groups on tours there, I talk about Therese as a young child of five, six years old, pointing to the stars and telling her dad that uh, God loves her because the letter T is formed in stars that mm. night, and she points to it. So, so much of the stained glass there does mimic and imitate the sufferings that mm. they all have gone through. Mm-hmm. Yes, and she also, St. Therese, was uh, sickly, even as, at a young age, and certainly this uh, life of sacrifice. Yes, Yes, very definitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then going into St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, certainly um, when you are uh, reforming an order as they were, um, there were definitely some challenges involved in that. There were some, uh, you know, we are human beings, right? (laughs) There are so many different kinds of personalities going on. Uh, And you... You certainly see sacrifice as well with um, the Inquisition. The Spanish Spanish Inquisition was going on, and uh, um, you know T- Teresa and John of the Cross did suffer, um, being John of the Cross being in prison for a brief yes, period of time. But that wasn't so much the Inquisition mm-hmm. as it was the Carmelites themselves mm-hmm. who did not want to reform and go back to the stricter ways. And so to fight against him and uh, Teresa of Avila, they did. They locked him in a closet Mm. for, it was seven and a half months. Wow. And uh, I I visualize the stained glass in the basilica is so strong. Mm. It is so beautiful. But as you come in the back door, if you look along the right side, all of the stained glass windows on that side have to do with John of the Cross. Mm. And one of the center ones shows him in that tiny cell. And then there is a glimmer of light as the Blessed Mother gives him a concept, an idea of how he can escape. And so the, the, the stained glass there is just extraordinary. You've got to come and, and look. And w- we give tours, so we'll be glad to include you and explain everything. Beautiful. Well, you know, that is the Basilica of the Little Flower. And uh, we are talking about Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. Um, I know, friends, that, uh, you know, this idea of sacrifice that we've been talking about, uh, ultimately, we all have sacrifices in our lives. But uh, we... I just like those saints that you've mentioned, you know, they all pointed to something that gave them hope, that gave them that sense that God was with them in the midst of that. We are talking about uh, Mount Carmel. So we are in the Holy Land, and I'm here with Marjorie McClellan, who is a Third Order Carmelite, and we've been talking about the beautiful, uh, spiritual, rich history around uh, Mount Carmel and the Carmelites. So let us enter then our pilgrimage site, the Church of Stella Maris on Mount Carmel. And the doors that we see here on the church are these heavy bronze doors with figures cast into them. And on the left door is a life-size image of Elijah holding a torch and with his other arm outstretched and on the right is uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel and she is carrying the infant Jesus. 
Jesus is holding the brown scapular. And you mentioned that a little bit ago in our previous segment, Marjorie, but uh, we will talk about the brown scapular in more detail in a bit. At the top of the doors to the Church of Stella Maris is the bright shining sun. And to me, that is reminiscent of Elijah's calling down fire from heaven on Mount Carmel. So already, as we're entering this church, it's giving us these bronze doors. And this is one thing that I love, Marjorie, about going on pilgrimage in the Holy Land, because these churches have these beautiful bronze doors, typically on the holy sites, that prepare us, right, to enter into the church itself. And they're giving us that background of this is the place that you're entering. So above uh, the entrance is the seal of the Carmelites. And we see a sword that is held by the arm of Elijah and stretching out from a crown and a Latin biblical text from 1 Kings 19.10. It says, I am on fire with zeal for the Lord God of hosts. And uh, that is part of the seal of the Carmelites. Is that not correct? That's correct. Exactly. Oh. All right. So looking down to the floor, then we're coming into the church and looking down to the floor, we see a beautiful marble pattern arranged in a flower shape with the words Ave, Mar- Ave Maris Stella or Hail Mary Star. And that is, of course, referring to her title that you mentioned before, Star of the Sea. Um, you know, Marjorie, that uh, title is so beautiful for um, for Mary, a star of the sea. Um, I think it goes back to what you were talking about with St. John uh, of the Cross, and he looked to Mary as a guide. You know, he looked to Mary as the, the guide for him, the hope for him, uh, when he was imprisoned by his fellow Carmelites. And uh, in that difficult moment of his life that he was looking to Mary as almost like a star, as the sailors look to the stars for guidance, right, and for direction. So that is a beautiful um, title for Mary, Stella Maris. As we enter, we see the church is built over the cave of Elijah to protect it. And as we walk down the center aisle of pews, we come face to face with this real rock grotto. So Marjorie, why don't you help us to picture what all is going on in front of us as we're looking at this site? Well, the cave of Elijah uh, is directly uh, underneath the main altar. In Mm -hmm. other words, the church's main altar uh, is built over it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you literally kind of go down into uh, this dark brown cave (laughs) with Elijah on the altar, the statue of him there. But this roughly formed rock kind of frames him, Mm. uh, his standing statue on the altar. Uh, It's an intimate space, but it's strange. We had, when we went with our blind priest, Mm -hmm. Father Pat Martin, Mm -hmm. uh, we had about 20 people who were able to cram together down under in this cave wow. area and I can I get chills even now thinking about it because of all the places I've been that one has affected me the most mm. um, we were standing there um, and um, our blind priest began to pray a beautiful prayer of Elijah And we all joined in because we knew it, almost like a whisper, breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love the things you love and do what you would do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with you I have one will to live and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, my soul with grace refine, until this earthly part of me glows with your fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God, so I shall never die, 
but live with you the perfect life in your eternity. I cannot tell you how overwhelming and strong it is to be in his cave mm. where Elijah knelt, where he prayed, where God saved him mm -hmm. from what was going on, Jezebel and the others trying to kill him. So it, it drew us together as a pilgrimage group even more than we had been before. But so many of us made space to kneel as mm. well on the rock, the dark brown rock, and looking into Elijah's face mm -hmm. in the statue, it, it still moves me tremendously mm -hmm. of all the places that I have been on pilgrimages. Wow. Yes, and, um, you know, as you're speaking, I, I think back also to my time there as well, and uh, it was the first holy site that I, I visited on my Holy Land pilgrimage. And so for me to see, yes, that real cave that is spoken about in scripture, it just uh, takes your breath away, doesn't it? To really, um, of course, you were an old pro then, that was your third pilgrimage <laughs> to the Holy Land. But uh, it, to really and truly see and experience the things of scripture so that they are tangible and literally you can run your hands on that rock you know and, and there's no glass <laughs> something that goes that far back mm -hmm. you're not looking at the stable where mm -hmm. christ was born mm -hmm. you're not looking at the sepulcher mm -hmm. you are looking where elijah stood right a far precursor of christ's mm -hmm. coming so it's it's astounding mm -hmm. it is astounding yes it's a gift uh and you mentioned father pat martin he's the the chaplain of Pilgrim Center of Hope, and uh, he very often does uh, use that prayer. He does very often offer that prayer, breathe on me, a breath of God. Yes. Uh, and uh, what a what a lesson for us as well that, uh, you know, even if we can't go visit, right, Elijah's cave, that we can still have the same experience that Elijah did, really, in a way, that we're all kind of running from something. We're all sort of, we have things that are chasing after us, no matter what, you know, whether that's a, a workload or a, a problem in our lives, stressful situation, and so forth. But uh, we all can pray that that prayer, and we can all listen for the voice of God in that still, small voice. And you're touching on something that is true for me. Um, I... I knelt there going, why did God call me here mm. after 40 plus years of marriage, four children, 13 grandchildren, his loving hand is guiding every moment of mm. my life and continues to do so through Carmel. Gift is the center of this pilgrimage and all of the pilgrimages that I've made. Uh, it was truly such a blessing from mm -hmm. God, feeling Jesus Christ's humanity, seeing him walk the rocks and mountains, and then going all the way back to Elijah's time, mm -hmm. seeing his cave and knowing that this is God revealing himself to me in a deeper way. Beautiful. So that uh, it, it really, my husband was so taken aback. He said that coming to the Holy Land had gone from just an interest to a desire six months ago to a compulsion in <laughs> recent months. So it was, it was beautiful for both of us. I don't think there was anyone who was there in that cave kneeling on that rock who wasn't extremely touched. Wow, yes. Well, um, thank you for sharing all that. And, uh, you know, the cave itself, just give you a better idea besides as you're listening uh, friends, besides the cave, uh, we and the uh, altar that you mentioned that is actually within the cave um, with a statue of Elijah. So we see, um, first of all, there is an inscription above the cave that reads in Latin, in this cave stayed occasionally the great leader and father of the prophets, Elijah the Tishbite. And on the floor... Of before you get to the cave, uh, there are three markers 
that commemorate the founders of the Carmelite order. So there are, there's Berthold, St. Brocardus, and Prosper. And there are candles burning to the side on the left side, I remember, um, as you kind of step down into the grotto area. There are candles there. And uh, then across the back of the cave, there's a statue of Elijah uh, over the altar. And uh, there are two traditions about the location of the tomb of Elisha, who was Elijah's successor. And one tradition actually indicates that he was buried here in this, in this cave. So, um, yes, to, again, paint the picture for our listeners, the walls of the church itself are marble. So over the cave area, there is an altar uh, that you mentioned, Marjorie, and that's the main altar of the church. And uh, above that is a statue of Mary, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, as she holds the infant, a Christ child. And she is wearing a blue dress with some gold details. And the detailing around the sanctuary area, the whole area there, involves uh, flowers and floral designs, as well as a relief of the Holy Spirit descending from heaven. So again, all this beautiful imagery of the Holy Spirit. The ceiling in the rotunda there over the main altar is a blue with gold stars across it. And there is an oculus window in the ceiling that looks like the sky has really opened up and God's glory is just coming down upon us. So we see then um, on the left-hand uh, wall, as we're looking towards the main altar, there is a painted rendition of the glorious Sacred Heart of Jesus. And we also see two scripture verses, Song of Songs 7-5, which reads, Thine head upon thee is like Carmel. And Isaiah 35-2, which says, The excellency of Carmel and Sharon they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. So uh, all these beautiful images of Our Lady, of um, Mount Carmel, and uh, Marjorie, as we're looking around the church of Stella Maris, there are several striking paintings of the Carmelite saints in the church, and each of these niches is flanked by some reddish stone columns. So on the north side, we see uh, St. Joseph sitting with the infant Jesus. And gazing on them in the painting are St. Teresa of Avila, who has a book and flowers at her knees on the ground, while she gestures toward St. John of the Cross, who is holding a cross in his right hand and op holding open his left hand, and there are also books at his knees. And I believe those books uh, indicate to us, of course, their their writings, their important uh, foundation of the, the Carmelite discalced order, but also um, that they are doctors of the church, right? That they uh, have contributed so many important things uh, to Catholic spirituality and faith. So another painting shows St. Simon Stock, and this is where, Marjorie, I'd like to bring you in because he is kneeling during his apparition of Mary and the Christ Child, and he's depicted receiving the brown scapular from her. And we usually see this image with the Virgin Mary giving him um, the two small pieces of brown cloth that are generally what we know when we think about the, uh, the brown scapular that's typically worn by the laity. But in the painting, she is giving the long brown piece of cloth that's worn by the Carmelite religious. So can you talk to us a little bit about the brown scapular? What is uh, some of the background of that? And uh, how does that then relate to us today? I'll be glad to. Uh, the brown scapula is a Marian devotion that originated at about the same time as the rosary and like the Marian shrine in Walsingham, had its origin in England. In the 13th century, during the time of the Crusades, St. Simon Stock went on pilgrimage to the Holy Land where he met a group of hermits on Mount Carmel. These claimed to be the successors of Elijah 
and his followers and attracted uh, by their way of life, Simon returned with them to England when the situation became very dangerous in Palestine because of the Saracens. They settled in Aylesford in Kent, and in 1254, Simon was elected superior general of the now mendicant Carmelites, who were regarded somewhat like the other mendicant orders, such as the Franciscans and the Dominicans. Simon founded other houses as the order began to grow, but he faced many problems as the original solitary ideal of the hermits changed towards the more communal approach of the mendicants. These weren't just internal problems. Older religious orders also resented the arrival of these newcomers. Mm. Simon withdrew to his monastic room or cell, probably at Cambridge by this time, to try and gain some relief from the problems faced, both by himself and his Carmelite order, and in order to pray to Mary. It was then that he had his famous vision of her bringing the brown scapula to him with the following words, which are preserved in a 14th century narrative. This will be for you and for all Carmelites the privilege that he who dies in this will not suffer eternal fire. And that's the Sabentine privilege. Okay. Mm -hmm. The scapular promise is based on the two elements of Mary's spiritual maternity and her mediation of grace. That is, that she, one, is the spiritual mother of all mankind, as well as, two, the channel by which all grace comes to us, understood in the sense that she, too, is dependent on... Uh, the sole mediation of Christ, her son. Mm -hmm. This promise implies that Mary will intercede to ensure that the wearer of the scapula obtains the grace of final perseverance, that is, of dying in a state of grace. Mm. The, yeah, so uh, I was just going to say that uh, that gives us a good uh, background for the scapular. And now... I believe you're going to get into what what actually is the scapular, um, both the traditional scapular as well as the modern day, the typical one that you see lay people wearing. Yes. What lay people wear, of course, is very different. It's mm -hmm. the smaller version uh, to what those in the order have, the full length mm. brown scapula. The modern scapula consists of two pieces of brown rectangular cloth, roughly an inch by an inch and a half, which is usually decorated with appropriate Marian pictures and are connected by two narrow brown cords worn around the neck and shoulders, hanging down to the front and back. This is a devotion which has also been continuously encouraged by more recent popes. And so it is not something that has lost its power even if it may have become unfashionable in some circles. As in the case of the rosary, a whole series of popes have, by virtue of their unique position of authority, approved the scapula devotion. Beautiful. So, um, yes, thank you for sharing that story. That really brings alive the artwork that we see at uh, Stella Maris Church on Mount Carmel, and uh, that really helps us to tie in, again, everything into the church. So as we look then at the ceiling of this main rotunda, we're standing in the main area of Stella Maris Church on Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. We look up to the ceiling of the, the main rotunda, and that also has an oculus window in the center. It's really one of the most beautiful, colorful, brightly painted elements of any Roman Catholic church I have ever seen. Um, it, of course, I haven't been to St. Peter's yet, but uh, I I really do just that the, the brightness of the colors and the variety of colors is so beautiful. There are scenes of Elijah being raised up to heaven on a chariot of fire, and there's also David playing on the harp. 
And we see the prophets Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah. We see even the Holy Family. And we see the the founders of the Carmelite Order. So there's so much going on. It kind of summarizes the, uh, the history of the Carmelites from even back to Elijah now to the present day. And uh, it's just beautiful that, you know, when we visit these places, they really anchor us in history and in, in our place in history and how we are connected to all of these things. So on the north side of the church, there is a stained glass window showing that famous scene from Second Kings, the departure of Elijah on a chariot of fire into heaven, uh, while his successor, Elisha, watches from the Jordan River. So really, we just have a few minutes left, Marjorie, but could you summarize for us when you visited Mount Carmel and saw this beautiful Stella Maris Church and stayed in the Pilgrim Hotel, the, the, the Pilgrim Guest House, what impacted you and your faith? It was a gift, pure gift, all the way. <laughs> Our Lord had called me long ago. I did not know where I was going, but led me to the apex, the place where it all began, mm. the prophet Elijah, um, the beautiful Stella Morris Church. Um, over and over again, I, I'm afraid I'm tearing up again because <laughs> that place, that church, Elijah's cave mm -hmm. especially, I went down to again and again during the short time we were there to kneel and pray. Um, our sweet Lord has just drawn me to Carmel over and over again, and I feel so gifted, so graced. Mm, beautiful. And thankful. Well, thank you for sharing and being with us here today, Marjorie. Um, we are just about out of time for today's episode of Journeys of Hope. Uh, as is our tradition, before we go, we want to give you a jewel for the journey, a spiritual gem from scripture, from a saint or a pope. And uh, you can reflect on this throughout your week. So today's jewel is from a great Carmelite, St. Teresa of Avila. And this is part of her prayers, many prayers that she's given us. But this is a very famous prayer from St. Teresa of Avila. Let nothing disturb you, nothing frighten you. All things are passing. God never changes. Patient endurance obtains all things. Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone suffices. So that is your jewel for the journey. All right, so our closing prayer today is from St. Therese of Lisieux. And let's pray together in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Draw me, Lord, we shall run. O oh, Jesus, I ask you to draw me into the flames of your love, to unite me so closely to you that you live and act in me. I feel that the more the fire of love burns within my heart, the more I shall say, draw me. The more the souls who will approach me will run swiftly in the odor of your ointments. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, uh, we've come to the end of our journey for today. Thank you for joining me on Journeys of Hope. Thank you, Marjorie, for joining me as well. Uh, we invite you to come visit Pilgrim Center of Hope, learn more about our threefold ministry of pilgrimages, conferences, and outreach. Fellow pilgrims, on behalf of Pilgrim Center of Hope, I want to thank you for joining us on this journey with the living stones. Because we are a pilgrim people, Strive to live your journey of hope with boldness, passion, and joy. Until next time, may God bless you. Safe travels. Journeys of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.